Welcome, everyone. On today's show, we have a good friend, Paul Josephek, who's also a CCAM founder with the company Receive, who's got a very interesting story, which we're going to hear in a second. But first, welcome, Paul. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to see you again. So we're going to start off, as we usually do, with learning a little bit more about who you are, where you started. So what did you study in university? What was your first job? Well, yeah, I grew up wanting to be a veterinarian way back when. And the first job out of school was actually with what was then Anderson Consulting, officially. But that wasn't technically my first job. I actually studied finance. So I started out as a genetics major, switched to finance. And I had a bunch of jobs before college and even during college, I was part of a startup. But the official first role I had was with Anderson Consulting. And I was in one of those waves of hires that basically, I think in October, when I went to St. Charles, which was their training academy outside of Chicago, I think there was like a couple thousand people that got hired. And it was that wave in the early mid nineties where they were just basically hiring anyone that they could get because they had so much business. And I actually had one of their German managing partners as a client in one of the businesses that I was in during college. So that's how the connection quasi came. He convinced me to potentially come and work for them. And that job lasted eight months. <laughs> so really, that was, that it, eight months was by my consulting career. I very quickly realized I'm not a consultant. So, so yeah, that's well, why I got you just started. quit or did you get fired? No, I quit. I quit. I definitely realized after being, I think my last gig there, I was on a public utilities project in Spring Valley, New York, which is middle of nowhere. And I realized that the commute, as well as being on these projects where I did not want to be at night, working 80 hour weeks, I just said, that's not the career for me. It wasn't the work I disliked per se the time, but it just felt so disingenuous. And the projects I was on just were not exciting. So I, I kind of turned my back on consulting quickly, but I feel the pain of everyone who does consulting and the people kind of came up the ranks through the BCGs and McKinsey's and whatnot of this world. Yeah. I have a respect for the amount of work they do, just like most bankers as well, right? Yeah, I did some consulting back, back in the day. Yeah, it kind of mapped with what you shared, although I did have some really fun trips with some colleagues. It's like a roaming tribe of friends, basically. Well, yeah, freshly out of college, making real money. And I remember when we went to St. Charles, I mean, you know, it's a bunch of 20 to 25 year olds with, you know, cash in their pockets, no families at home, majority of the people. And in a college campus like environment, it's fun. I enjoyed it. Was it. Fun. <laughs> so what did you do after, after you quit? Walked in, said, yeah, so when, I, when I quit, I kind of walked out literally and didn't have a plan. So I have to admit that I wasn't on some kind of a career path, but I had been approached by someone that knew me and they knew I spoke German. They knew I had lived in Europe and she had been working in a law firm in New York and they were looking for someone to come and basically build out a business development function in their European offices. And she knew that I was doing things in my previous roles that kind of were complementary. She knew I spoke German and I was actually also looking for a way to get to Germany because one of the reasons I joined Anderson, um, I was supposed to be on projects in Europe, but that never happened. So I basically went and looked for a way to get back to Europe. I spent my high school time, I spent a year in Germany as an exchange student. And then when I came back, I was in Germany throughout college. So I wanted to go to Germany and I proactively wanted to live in Europe. So an opportunity came up with a law firm called Davis Polk and Wardwell, which is one of the top corporate law firms out of New York. And yeah, I took over their business development for Europe and moved to Frankfurt, literally packed up, was on a plane, uh, wasn't sure how long I was going to be there. It was originally, I think when I signed the contract, it was supposed to be a three-year gig and that was 25 years ago now. So uh, I haven't left. What's corporate development for a law firm entail? <laughs> Good question. I think I kind of asked the same thing, but what we were doing in the late nineties. So I got there 97, I believe it was all the new markets were basically booming or just starting to boom. So you had NASDAQ, I guess, in the US and all these tech IPOs were happening, right? So it was kind of post Amazon and eBay and all the companies that went out, Netscape in the mid nineties. And what they were trying to do was actually promote their businesses. So you had this wave in the late nineties where a lot of law firms were doing sweat equity. They were trying to basically take startups public and instead of taking a fee, they took a cut via an equity component. We weren't doing that specifically, but we were trying to then work on tech IPOs. So uh, the business development role was actually facing primarily towards the banks that were mandated to take these companies public. But conversely, while I was there, we also started representing the actual startups going public. So we were on both sides of the equation for the actual IPO process, 
Mm -hmm. And then the second aspect of it was that there was a secondary listing that a lot of these companies would do in the U.S. called a Reg S 144A. And that was primarily the concept that Davis Polk was doing because they were working with law firms in Europe that were partners. So like in Germany, it was a law firm called Hegeler and Mueller, which is still around. Then they had specific partners in the UK and France. And I think they even went to Spain at some point. And that was the whole idea. It was basically taking companies public, listing them in Europe and the U.S., and it was a very lucrative business at the time. I mean, you have to imagine 97 till 2000 was an extremely lucrative time. I loved it because there was just so much going on. And I got a lot of access to very interesting companies. I mean, one of the deals that I worked on, which also ultimately led to my landing at SAP, was a business called Software AG. I and mean, it happened to be one of the largest software IPOs on the Neuer Markt, which was the German NASDAQ in the late 90s. And that was a deal where we represented Software AG. So it was a super interesting process. And you know what? I kind of made it up as I went, right? Like there wasn't anyone in that role before I went to Europe to then do that role. So I created my own position and it was fascinating, right? I got access to the bankers. I got access to the VCs. I was working with the lawyers. I kind of enjoyed the crazy nights there. I mean, it wasn't very different to consulting. We were sitting at the printers preparing IPO prospectuses, you know, basically living out of a print shop for three days, ready to take a company public doing all you know, the risk analyses and whatnot that had to go into an IPO prospectus, which were then at the time still printed physically, right? So you would create stacks, you know, thousands that would go out to the institutional investors. But one of the things that I found most interesting in the process, I got to see kind of everything that was being discussed about a company, right? So in preparing that prospectus for the IPO, you basically had to analyze the whole business. And I was utterly fascinated by the depth of, let's say, granular information that you would figure out about a business before it went public being connected to the lawyers and the bankers. And that's, I guess that's where my initial introduction into even venture capital came from. I didn't really realize what venture capital was. I knew ultimately what VCs were funding and then these companies were going public, but not until I left Davis Polk and went to SAP that I actually even really look at what the venture capital market was. And that I would even say that if you look back on the 20 plus years of my career, Everything I learned at Davis Polk, a little bit of the consulting component before that, but those two jobs very much influenced a lot of decisions I made about career steps thereafter. Yeah. So after that is when you joined and became a VC, basically. Yeah. So I got recruited out of, and from someone via Software AG, I got recruited by SAP to join their then SAP Ventures team, mm. now Sapphire Ventures. And I was there very early days, right? So they had started in the US actually, funnily enough at the German company, but they started their venture activity. Like SAP Ventures actually launched earlier in the US and there was a guy running it out of Palo Alto. And then I got hired by, who was then the former chief marketing officer of SAP, who took over SAP Ventures Europe. He brought me in. I had met him via Software AG. And long story short, he called me up. And I remember when I got recruited, he called me up and asked if I knew anyone who might fit the role without actually realizing he meant, was I interested, right? So it took me a night of sleeping on it where I raised my hand and said, oh, that's for me. Yeah, I mean, you and Harrison Ford have that in common when he was cast for Star Wars, you know? He was just a carpenter on set, you know? Sometimes that's how it works. I have to say it was just absolutely dumb luck. If anyone ever says, you know, they prepared for a career at that stage, I remember one funny anecdote. I literally, when I got the call about this position, I read a book called E-Boys, which was about the start of Benchmark Capital. It's a great book, but I mean, it's a fairy tale, right? If you actually now go and read E-Boys, um, you know, I, I presume by the time I'm 30, I'm a billionaire, right? Going into this industry, I'm like, I won the lotto. And this was 99, 2000. You have to imagine everything was just absolutely booming. And I literally thought I just you know, won the lottery getting that gig. And for the first, let's say, six months to 12 months, I couldn't have imagined a more exciting time. The people I got access to, the things I was seeing going on, even Europe was kind of going Batty around IPOs, you know, the full bubble was in its full bloom. Yeah. And um, I was super excited until I wasn't, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like- before we talk a little bit about your sort of VC years, I wanted to sort of maybe put a cap on your time helping manage and deal with IPOs. Uh, you know, one of the things that IPOs, you know, worked uh, as an intern uh, for an investment bank in Boston called Needham & Co. for a little bit. And what was really interesting there is that I saw some of the elements that define investment banking. And I remember some of the stuff is very much unexpected in terms of what the average person knows. And so I'm just curious, like, what are maybe the top three things that you think would be 
demystifying people on an IPO. Like, you know, you were talking about the granular details, but the reality could very well be darker than that or more amusing than that. And so I'm just curious, what are the things that most people would not know about a traditional IPO process that seems like it's probably a lot more structured or more thought out than it really is? Well, let me put it this way. The one thing that, I mean, things have probably also changed a little bit because so much more is digital now. I think a lot of these quasi, what were then very manual processes have very much become a little bit more efficient. I mean, we're talking about 24 years ago at this point when looking back, but I would say the thing that for me, I mean, the highest on the list of points, as you ask, in terms of what one wouldn't expect is the amount of time that went into determining the risk of a company. So all the risk factors that you have to list in that IPO prospectus. And I think this still is very much the case of any IPO because you have to inform the investors of anything that could possibly go wrong. And what I found absolutely fascinating is how much came out in that process. And ultimately, I would say the second point, how very targeted those risks were in terms of then being communicated, right? So you could have something, you know, the risk is that the market turns against the company, right? That's a risk that you would expect to see in there. Or you might have, let's call it management risk. The company won't be able to hire the best managers to continue the growth of the company or the growth trajectory. But these are a lot of these companies, none of the ones we represented, obviously, but a lot of these companies that were going public back in the late 90s, I mean, these were a hope and a dream. And that prospectus was putting a lot of things on paper that were still very much future forward. And there was a lot of aspirational things in there. But I think when you looked at some of these, and again, these processes were run very last minute. We were sitting at the printers, still making changes to the prospectus at the printer, literally knowing that the company was going public in three days trying to get these things done. And you had to have the prospectus available for all the institutional investors before it actually listed. And some of the risk factors that came up were absolutely fascinating. I mean, you know, founder married to CEO, right? I, I can't remember if that was one of the specific risks that we put in there, but there was some familial connection via the fact that, you know, two key individuals were married. But then there were also things in there where, you know, you would have never thought that would be considered a risk factor. And these things were going into the prospectuses. And again, I was so green at the time. I mean, I was in my early twenties. I had never actually, like, I got lucky to even be in that job at Davis Polk. Again, I was there to do biz dev and I was doing so many other things that technically weren't business development. And that's why I even said that I almost created my own role because I was kind of a go-between trying to do whatever was helpful. Right. I mean, that's kind of what my role was. I was a non-lawyer you know, quasi team member. And so I would say that the, what the risk factors were, that in and of itself was for me, absolutely eye-opening. The second part that I also was a little bit surprised by, and even in hindsight, I'm still actually shocked by it, is how disorganized everything was. You would think that these IPOs with the amount of money being raised, with the amount of people involved, all the parties on all sides of the transaction, I mean, it was like a circus trying to get one of these companies public. And I don't mean in terms of outward facing stuff, but the amount of work that went into taking a company public, which was just drudgery. Um, and, you know, purely admin around all these things that need to happen to take a company public and add kind of that international flavor to it as well, which is where the perspective I had, where it was taking a company public in Frankfurt or on the London exchanges or in Paris, in parallel, preparing an offering for the U.S. markets. I mean, it was drudgery and there was a lot of people involved and it was rough. And again, one of these anecdotes, I, I sound like an old war torn vet, but one of the things that I found so amusing is that I was on a, on a project, this was like probably 99, I think, um, where I was sitting with a lawyer on the counter side. Basically, we were stuck in what was a former server room going through documents because we were looking for documentation that had to be reflected in the IPO perspectives. And we were going through documentation to make sure nothing was missed. And the funniest thing is that I actually ran across this counterparty of mine in this process who ended up being a, one of the people described in Tim Ferriss's first book. So his four hour work week, he talks about this guy who opens up a search shop in Florianopolis or Floriopolis in, uh, in Brazil. And this is the guy, Hans, he was a German guy who I was sitting in a server room for three days, digging through documents. Right. And that for me is kind of like the second aspect of these IPOs that I found fascinating, but you would never think that, you know, like that so much of it goes into it. And then also, you know, I guess the third point is how many things go wrong. I mean, stuff went wrong left and right in the run-up. And we even had things get postponed or even canceled. I remember toward like kind of towards the end of when the bubble was bursting, 
we had a bunch of projects in the pipeline and then just for some completely random reason, the, the IPO just got cut out of nowhere, right? And it was so much work, so much effort. You know, you have founders, and again, I had direct access and you have founders who are about to basically cash millions and, you know, it just got turned off and you can imagine what a disappointment that is primarily for people who were, you know, basically in line to make a killing. And I mean, that was very much the tail end of it, right? So this is like the 2000 time frame, but that was also something that I definitely wouldn't have expected. And just to see how, I mean, completely random, the, the, probably the justification for something not happening could be so. Yeah, yeah no, was- it's interesting. You know, it's interesting how right now the IPO market's a little bit shut. And then it's just a strange phenomenon that we both, we've gotten to see a couple of times in our lifetime, that sort yeah. of cycle through it. Now, I want to fast forward a little bit through your VC period, not because it's not interesting, but because what's even more interesting is what you're doing now. But what I would like to do is, you know, how many years were you a VC for total? Wow. I guess officially 11 years, 12 years, Mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, One of the things that as VCs, you know, when you've been in the industry for a while, you realize is that it's a pattern recognition business, right? You try to make heuristics for decision-making based on what you've seen work and what doesn't work. And some of that becomes advice. And the VCs who give bad advice or who are potentially destructive in the way that they provide the advice are those that rely too heavily on those heuristics and perhaps are unaware of how quickly they can change, right? And those that are a little bit more benevolent are those that sort of showcase the data that they have to founders and then can sometimes look at these things and provide perspective to founders. So if we look at these 11 years that you spent as a VC and you try to compartmentalize your brain a little bit here, Mm -hmm. rewind the clock before you start receiving, what is the three pieces of advice that you would have given the Paul of now having that experience as a VC in the company that you're about to start. So you've just forked VC Paul and founder Paul, VC Paul is giving founder Paul advice before he starts receiving. I'm just curious what advice would have been. So hindsight 2020 advice basically to myself starting out. Yeah, actually, no, not even hindsight 2020, huh? This is, No site 2020. This is the bias or the sort of advice that you walked into creating receive that you might have now corrected. Well, I would say, I actually, let me answer the question a little bit differently. So a lot of the advice that I would have given myself and even did give myself, considering the fact that I was a former VC going back into a founder position is that, you know, it's fairly simple. So what I and via pattern matching and a lot of things that I saw and learned. And don't forget, I was a VC for 11 years, but I was also in a VC adjacent role for another seven years after that. So I had close to 20 years of being either actually the partner or doing something very much close to building startups. And I would say the key piece of advice that I would have probably given myself and I would still give to anyone is hire the best people. That was something that was talked about often. There's that saying, A players hire A players, B players hire C players. And if you don't have the right people around the table, everything else is almost completely irrelevant, right? So it's all about the people that you hire. That's a piece of advice. Definitely one piece of advice looking back that that is extremely relevant and would come up in any list that I would put together to answer that question. The second piece of advice, which again, it's almost contradictory, raise as much money as you can raise (laughs) while the raising is good. But don't spend too much as quickly as you can, because again, things can get worse. And I don't know what the right answer is because it's, again, that's contradictory, raise as much as possible, spend as little as possible, but be very cash effective is I guess the way to put it. That's definitely something that I would say is number two on the list. And a third piece of advice, and I hate to say it's not really advice you can take, it's be lucky. Because one of the things I think people really underestimate in this world and everything venture is you can have, you know, 99% rules, but if it's 1% bad luck, it could take you out at the knees or conversely, you know, you could have 99% shit show, which a lot of these startups are, and you get 1% of luck at the right time. And boom, the company is a unicorn. I won't bring up one of your portfolio companies that happened to be in the right place at the right time. That's Um, you. That's you. Well, that's you. Um, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Maybe that's a good segue to talk a little bit about the genesis of Receive. For those that read the description of this podcast episode, Receive is a platform that helps automate collections and recovery. And it wasn't 
born in a time when it's probably more obvious now um, in some ways, but I'm just curious, what was that chat that you were having with your co-founder where you're like, I know what we're going to start. Tell us that yes, story. It's actually, it, it goes back a little bit further even. So the funny aspect is that we actually built a business in this space before in my previous role. So I ran innovation for a large German conglomerate and this large conglomerate had their own debt collection company, i.e. a servicer. And this is, I'm going to throw around a lot of lingo from the industry, but the corporate was called the auto group and they had a servicer called AOS, EOS. And we were also originally mandated in that position that my co-founder and I had to develop new technologies or new businesses for this servicing company that Otto had. So we actually started looking at the debt collection space probably in the 2011, 12 timeframe when we launched that business that I was a part of. And so we ended up building a business that was supposed to be pretty much like a funnel for the collections business that the Otto group had. So we said, look, if we get technology into the large enterprises, which ultimately take that debt and pass it on to the servicers, there's a fundamental need to digitize that funnel. And if you create a value chain or something that connects two value chains, which is the enterprise and then the servicer using technology, you add a ton of efficiency to the market. What we realized while building that business is that you actually need an end-to-end -end solution. And there's very little technology in the debt collection space. And right now, if you look at Receive and if you look at our website, we're a collections player. We're somewhere in that industry, but we actually aren't, right? So what Michael and I, my co-founder, started talking about way before starting Receive and while building the previous company, what we basically started discussing is that there's a much bigger industry underlying what most people know as debt collection. So if you think about, and I'm going to simplify this extensively, but if you look at, let's say, a large business that you know, lends money, so I'm just going to use a lender because it's probably the easiest way, but even retailers, you know, purchase on invoice or payment plans or whatever, technically they're lending, right? So anyone who has a lending relationship with their customer, but let's say a large company has an outstanding loan, the debtor, i.e. the customer who becomes a debtor when they don't pay, what happens thereafter? So you try and collect that money. And what happens in the case where you can't collect is you assign it to one of these debt collection agencies who does it as a service to you, or that debt is sold. And when that debt is sold, it is purchased by investors or the servicers, because the servicers sometimes act as investors, they have capital to buy that debt. But what most people don't realize is that this industry is huge. We're talking about trillions of dollars or euro or whatever that are transacted every year in all of these debt transactions. Debt is a very big part of the economy. Many times people even ask me, like, will there be debt in the future if everything is paid by credit card and everything is digital? There's always going to be debt. It's a long time before debt goes away. I mean, the world ultimately and growth has been funded by debt. And it's not bad. It's actually good because it allows for a lot of things to happen. And so many businesses leverage debt to grow. So people think about debt negatively. It's actually not that negative. It's actually a net positive for a lot of things that have been done for the good of, let's say, the economy or the world or whatever you want to position it as. And now to basically tie those ends together, it's very much my co-founder's vision, but I bought into it fully is that we said, look, there's so many transactions happening around the debt value chain. They start at the large company where that debt is originated, where someone doesn't pay. But a lot of things actually happen in trying to resolve that debt. And there's also a lot of transactions around that debt. And we said, look, if we can potentially help those enterprises resolve those debt issues, it doesn't go into the value chain. So that's one point where our software platform helps resolve an issue that could ultimately become a much bigger issue for the originator who doesn't get paid or for the debtor who can't afford to pay and potentially has a problem. But now to almost simplify all of it, we set out to say, look, all of these steps of the value chain from the originator to the servicers, to the investors who buy the debt can be fundamentally done with one platform and the data, all of the data that's generated by all these transactions and all the data that ultimately is part of what happens in the debt value chain. That's what we're addressing with receive. So a lot of times, you know, when my mom asks me, are you a debt collector? I've never answered that question. Yes, because we, we don't do the debt collection. We provide technology to all the players in the debt value chain, trying to optimize the processes. So yes, there is an aspect to debt collection where, you know, you're trying to potentially recover money from someone who can't pay, but there's ways to resolve that with installment plans, giving them deferrals, helping to get that debtor out of that situation, because obviously the person who gave them that money and the person who can't pay that money, they both profit from the resolution of that problem. And that's what we set out to do. That's what we were talking about. And we got to that final story piece by piece, because we looked at the beginning of the value chain 
And then we realized there's something much bigger here. Um, and there's a lot more that can be done. And even now in the first, let's say, four and a half years of the existence of Receive, we've zigged and zagged in our roadmap because we saw that there's a much bigger game to be played where we didn't even see all of these points back in, let's say, 2018 when we were planning to launch Receive. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. It, it does. I mean, it's what your company does. So, <laughs> you know, to some extent, I think that's a beautiful explanation of it. But one of the things that maybe the listeners are probably wondering is, is Receive in the value chain, is it mostly just an efficiency aggregator for all the parts? Or is it at the same time, because it exists within the value chain, yields better outcomes or both? So initially, so if you look at the beginning of the value chain, it's very much like workflows, it's digitization, it's also a transformation of businesses. Because what you can't forget, I mean, one of the other things and one of the benefits of what we're doing with Receive is that if you look at the enterprise and let's call it the transformation or digitalization of the enterprise, it all started with revenue driving processes. Everything sales, marketing oriented was digitized in the enterprise. And that started in the nineties, even eighties, right? I mean, look at SAP. I mean, that's basically what SAP grew on the back of over 40 years. Then you had kind of the shift to, let's say just regular workflows that are core to a business, UiPath. 10 years back, UiPath started basically automating a lot of things in the day-to-day -day core business of a company. But what very few people realize is that kind of the tail end of what happens in a large business, finance, accounting, I mean, even the fintech wave of the last, let's say, five years has been addressing those issues. Collections is in the basement of finance and accounting, right? So it's like kind of the last part of the enterprise that is being addressed right now in terms of transformation. So what our platform originally does is it allows you to first digitize and, and automate a lot of these workflows. If you think about the typical collection strategy, right? Every company has a collection strategy. Right now, it's hard-coded. And the software that a large bank or a large retailer or a large public utility uses to do their collections is provisioned by the IT, which means that it's basically the way things were done 20 years ago, right? You have an IT department that gives people that are working in the day-to-day -day operations software, which that the world changed, right? So the world has actually changed in the sense that people now in operations want to pick their own technology and they want to pick their software and they don't want it provisioned by the IT department. And hence, what also unfortunately is the problem is that the IT department has to make all the changes. So I'll just use a very simple kind of aspect of what our collection strategies do. You want to send a letter, you want to follow it up with an email 24 hours later. If that email isn't open, you want to follow up with an SMS. It's a very simple three-step process in a collection strategy. If you want to change those steps in a current existing system, it becomes an IT project where it could take months to make that change. In our platform, you basically look at a visual tree and you move boxes around and you basically change the whole strategy on the fly, which means that someone who runs collections for a large organization can test and dynamically adapt things. That's the first step of what we do. The second step, obviously, you start collecting all the data. You know what happens. You know exactly what works, what doesn't work. You can even compare these strategies to like a Facebook. Facebook has a billion interactions on their stream. So when they test things, they get so much feedback on what works and doesn't work that they can almost real time adapt what their algorithm feeds you in the stream. We're taking that and kind of moving it into these collection strategies, saying that as soon as you learn anything, you can adapt it immediately to your strategy to optimize that strategy. Once you have all this data and once you know everything that's happened with that claim and that individual unpaid bill back to origination, which is when someone signed a contract or bought something, that data becomes extremely useful for anything that happens later along the value chain because you know exactly how that individual behaves. You know exactly how that individual basically has reacted to things where you basically can get someone onto an installment plan or give them a better rate or whatever. It even helps you kind of look at your core business. So as a lender, if you know exactly what's going to happen in your collections process, you can actually adapt your lending strategy. If you know your collections processes are more effective you can actually be a little bit more of a risk taker in your lending strategy, allowing you to address a much bigger market. So that's very much what happens at our customers now with the platform. But once you get to the point of either selling that debt or even the investors who ultimately buy that debt, they can use the platform and leverage the data that's in the platform to do their part of the business better, which is pricing those portfolios of debt, i.e. when they buy you know, $5 billion worth of debt and they pay $500 million for it, is $500 million the right price? The more data you have, the more informed you are and the better buying decision you can make because you can price that portfolio. It becomes very much inside baseball once you get into the later stages of debt, because if you don't have that domain expertise, you have no idea what's going on.
But that's ultimately what we're trying to do is that we want to capture the data by automating and digitizing at the early stages of the value chain. But ultimately, we want that data to make everything much more efficient and effective throughout the whole value chain. I mean, to some extent, it brings up the question of how much you kind of spread out in that value chain, because by being the platform that has visibility, a person's response interval between, let's say, the outbound email and the SMS, to some extent, you can start extrapolating behavior. And right. you can either move it forward into what would be potential risk management or even a fraud. And then if you look at the very end, you can actually have your own mini hedge fund and be a buyer of the own stuff your software flags up. So how do you think about where you sit in the ecosystem as a billion dollar company? Because you don't lack ambition. So to some extent, this could go more than just being in this part that currently is an efficiency gains problem. Yeah, you know, it becomes much, much bigger. The tagline that we're using quite often is we want to become like the Bloomberg of debt. And the reason I bring that up is that if you look at, and most people are probably too young to, to know this, but if you look at Bloomberg in the late 70s, early 80s, they started selling terminals that they built $25,000 a month for real-time stock info. And it wasn't just the stock info I price, but it was also the fundamentals that underlie a stock. So if you think about today, if you're buying Apple or Tesla, they, those are businesses that have absolutely nothing to do with one another. They kind of do. Okay, maybe it's a bad example, Colgate versus Tesla. But these are fundamentally different businesses, but you have a stock price, which is reflecting the performance of the company. You can't do that for debt portfolios right now. So if you have a portfolio of, let's say, gym membership fees that hasn't been paid, and you're comparing it to mortgages, right? Two completely different businesses, different behaviors of the underlying debtors, except it's completely you know, night and day. And right now, when investors are buying those debt portfolios, these are large projects. They bring in consultants, 30 analysts are thrown into a server room and are scrubbing through data to try and price that portfolio. What we think we could fundamentally do is we can create the ability to trade debt, just like trading stocks, right? So what's the big, big grand vision of what ultimately Receive can do is we can create you know, a digital transactions market, just like stocks are being transacted for debt portfolios. Again, it's a very grand vision, whether the market evolves that way, it's a couple of years out, but that's kind of the view that we have of what we could do with Receive and ultimately if we get big enough. And it is a long journey. It is, there's a lot of pieces of the pie that need to come into play, but that's the goal of what we're trying to do with the data and all this automation. And we're trying to pretty much also digitize the whole value chain much more so than it is right now. Yeah. And, and so where does Receive intersect? I mean, we were talking about this a little bit a second ago about fraud. Where does Receive play? with fraud teams within an organization like that it seems like there's room for the two things to collaborate it's like malware and spam in the same software but i'm just trying to understand how do you think about the distinction between what you do and where the fraud team comes in so at the large enterprise we usually sit in the same vertical so i.e the chief risk officer usually owns fraud and debt or the coo if there isn't a chief risk officer and at times the cfo we tend to sit in the same department as the fraud folks. Um, and a lot of these solutions out there that are basically addressing fraud are very much complementary to what we do. We don't compete at all. We're working together and we'll always work together because we're not trying to use receive to identify fraud. But if you think about what ultimately the value is that if you can identify that something is either fraud or a collections case, right? You need to make that decision early to save money. Because if you realize that it's fraud, then you basically put it into the channel of addressing fraud. And if you realize that it's not fraud, but it's a collections issue, you try and address it with the collection strategy, which oftentimes also is to remedy it, right? So with fraud, you've lost that money and you're maybe trying to recover it, or at least you're trying to report it. Um, It's highly unlikely that you're going to recover. But in the case of what we then unearth is that if it's a collections case, we can also determine if it's worth pursuing, right? So same thing like a fraud case, you basically determine, is it fraud? And how much do we want to throw at it to try and resolve that problem, i.e. whatever credit card or whatever the actual fraud was, fake devices, whatnot. And same with us, that you're trying to inform a decision in the back end of the organization to determine how much time and effort do we want to put into this. And if you think about, let's say, even in collections, nowadays, the typical effort is putting someone on the phone, talking to that person. It's cost, it's resources. If you can automate a lot of that and do it you know, asynchronously with be it email or messaging of some sort, allow for self-service by that debtor, you can significantly decrease the cost. Same thing when it comes to fraud. If you determine that you, know, you could potentially chase it down or not, that's gonna also inform your decision of how much are you willing to spend on it. 
these are the things that chief risk officers are thinking about, right? I mean, that's their day to day of what's this going to cost me? How much time and effort do I want to spend? Do I want to give it right to the lawyers or to a servicer? That's a decision that fraud technology as well as receive make as a very complementary process. Yeah. And there's a, I painted it as a line, but it's actually more like a triangle because there's fraud. And then there is on the other part of the triangle is the credit assessments, right? Okay. And then there is collections. And I'm wondering, take a company like Credit Kudos or any of these companies that help streamline credit analysis. Where do you play with those guys? Because to some extent, it's weird. Like you, to some extent, you probably have really interesting data about the attributes and sure. the, the elements that people that end up in your pipeline have, which then could feed into more accurately into credit assessment. But how, where does that line get blurred? I can dumb this down. I mean, as you probably know at this point, almost every fintech ultimately ends up becoming a scoring business, right? And we're simply part of that scoring componentry and it's where the collections score, at least at the enterprise um, in the early stages. So if you think about like a Credit Kudos or any of these lenders, our data and basically all of the, let's say analytics that are coming out of what we do should flow up into their credit assessment process because it's just another metric that they can use to optimize what they're doing top level, determining whom to give credit to, right? So if you know exactly how someone is gonna behave in the collections process, you can already use that information to inform your decision of whether to lend to them or not, or how to lend to them, right? So it's again, I mean, everyone knows this at this point, when you show up on a website, based upon even the IP, very, very simple things, the IP of you know, where you happen to be sitting, the device you're on is already informing what happens on the other end, right? There's that basic thing of never use a MacBook to book a flight, right? It's actually cheaper if you're using a PC. Um, same thing ultimately happens for any of these credit uh, businesses. They need to have as much information as possible. And you're right in painting that picture as a triangle, right? Because it's components that basically should be informing the core business. It's also how we help sell our product. We tell people, look, this is no longer somewhere in the basement of accounting. Collections is key. And if you think about what's happening right now, Jason Lemkin of Saster fame wrote an article years ago that I always share to people where I say, look, he wrote this, I think in a previous downturn, it might even be after like 2008, 2009, where he said, one of the biggest issues that a lot of SaaS companies have is that they go out and sell a ton of business, i.e. SaaS uh, subscriptions, but they always forget to collect or they underestimate the risk or threat of not collecting fast enough. Because if you don't raise enough money to bridge the gap where your resources are completely engaged trying to deliver the product, you could even go out of business with a very high revenue basis because you're not collecting fast enough. Funnily enough, we're getting a lot of inbound right now from companies that are selling SaaS subscriptions to startups. As we all know, the venture community right now is a little bit slow to react in terms of new fundings. Only the best businesses are getting funded. But a ton of companies right now are simply not able to collect because their customer base is startups. And a lot of these startups are determining where do I actually pay and not pay, or they're about to go out of business. So you have top line issues with collections and it, it all comes back, right? Your core business might not involve collections per se, but indirectly it does. Yeah. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. It does. And what have been the unexpected difficulties of building your business? Because to some extent, your business is one of these ones where you're like, well, it's a no-brainer. I'm like, if you're a business, like, why wouldn't yeah. you use receive? Because what your alternative is going to be something that's really clunky and difficult back office -y stuff. Yeah. What well, What are the things that you found from a go-to-market? And I think a lot of people who are listening to this are probably in a similar boat trying to sell solutions to people that are obvious. But yeah. what, what are the things that you had unexpectedly found difficult? Well, one of the most difficult aspects is our timing, which you can never get right. So I don't blame myself for it, but we started 2018, 19. We officially founded the business in February of 2019. So we got smacked in the face by COVID, um, you know, full bore. Everyone said COVID hit, you guys should be making cash left and right because everyone's going to be unable to pay their bills. All these companies are, you know, basically shut down. People aren't making money. What was the difficulty? The fact that the government started subsidizing everything and it kicked back any collections issues by a year when COVID basically started. So all these subsidies and all these government, let's call it mandates, made sure that our problem didn't become a problem. It should have been a huge problem and it actually went away. So funnily enough, in 2020, once people stopped going out and once people weren't able to go and spend their typical monthly you know, amount that they were on luxuries, all of a sudden you had this weird effect of COVID. People started repainting all their debt. No one thought they would, but they had nothing else to do. They couldn't go out to restaurants. They weren't going on vacation. They weren't buying new cars because they didn't need new cars. 
all of a sudden they started paying down their debt. So when everyone thought that we should have been skyrocketing in 2020, all of a sudden the market completely turned against us because of COVID. A year later, we weren't out of COVID. Everything got pushed another year. So 2020 and 2021, we were basically on hold. We were still able to get some of our customers and we actually were able to sell a lot of the efficiency versus let's say the performance. But 2020 and 2021 were just extremely hard because the actual problem that everyone thought was there for us to address wasn't there. Then come 2022, Ukraine kicked off. So what ultimately happened on the back of Ukraine, a lot of these large enterprises started thinking twice about where they want to spend money because they didn't know where the economy was going. So, you know, after having two years of waiting for a lot of these companies to come out of all these subsidized benefits on the collections front, all of a sudden the industry became very nervous about uh, spend on SaaS platforms. And especially in large enterprise, they were saying, where do we want to spend? Are we going to spend on top line revenues or are we going to worry about collections? The market might completely tank in a year from now. We need to basically have revenues versus worrying about collections. So let's kick the can down the road. And then ultimately, I and as you can tell, this question is very pertinent to a lot of t- questions I've been getting. And now we have the last year where the venture markets are becoming extremely difficult. So we have to be very cautious as a company, thinking about where do we want to spend? We had to make a lot of cuts and whatnot, making sure that our run rate was two plus years versus what would have been nine months at the time because we planned on going out and raising more money. And we're still trying to catch up on all the opportunities. So um, yeah, from a timing perspective, we couldn't have made it harder on ourselves. And I would say one of the last aspects of all of this is there haven't been that many successful enterprise SaaS companies out of Europe. So Europe in and of itself is not as evolved as the US markets are when it comes to people from the industry. So even recruiting has been much harder. I knew it was hard and I always knew enterprise was hard in Europe. I mean, I come out of that world as a VC, but I, I probably underestimated how difficult it would be with all those other aspects that I just listed out to recruit people because you have to imagine someone who's, you know, a a top notch enterprise product guy, right. And who has domain expertise in at least a complementary business to what we do three or four times back to back annually, that person was asking themselves, do I want to join a startup right now? Or do I want to go from a series B startup to a seed stage startup? So yeah, we've had a very challenging run. And I have to say that I keep reminding my team that I'm super proud of what they've accomplished and what we've been able to do as a company in terms of also reacting to all these things, right? I mean, technically we should have run out of money long ago, but we reacted super early in terms of taking respective measures to make sure that we still have enough cash in the bank now. We're still well-funded through next year. We actually have revenues. So we have been able to go out and generate larger accounts. Um, Yeah, so we definitely learned a lot, but it hasn't been easy. It's funny because those three things that you just mentioned, and I didn't ask you to like give me three, but they map neatly to the three pieces of advice that you would have given a pre-received Joseph Pack uh, on on starting it. So timing was your being lucky, hiring, uh, which is all about the people, and then the advice, you know, it's just like raise as much money as you can because you might need to drag it out for a while. So it doesn't surprise me. And one of the things that is really interesting, you know, you mentioned your co-founder, Michael. Um, You know, you guys have been working together for a while and you know, he drives clearly a part of the product. How do you guys manage that relationship? What are your thoughts on keeping successful co-founder relationships? Get coaching is my number one. Even it's kind of almost like marriages, right? If you look at successful marriages, the ones that actually start therapy before there's problems are the ones that tend to get the most value out of therapy. Um, Or there's some, I remember some podcast, someone mentioned a book that some divorce lawyer wrote. And I think the title of the book is If You're in My Office, It's Too Late for marriages. And I say it's the exact same thing for co-founders, especially kind of the situation where Michael and I are in. I mean, he's an absolute brilliant engineer. I'm very much the salesperson. We both have addressed our respective aspects of the company. So I'm very much the commercial guy. He's very much product and engineering. Again, we've been working together for a long time. I mean, there was a phase in our previous company where I saw Michael, you know, 10 times more than I saw my own wife. So we actually spent a lot of time in the trenches together which also catches up to you at some point after spending so much time in the trenches. We also went through an evolution in our lives, right? I've known him since I was in my mid thirties. We both started families, bought homes, a lot of the kind of things that happen while building companies. So I think one of the key things is that you want to coach. And I actually ended up using the coach that you recommended, which for us was probably a very, it was just such a perfect combination of the fact that this person happened to be out of the military, weirdly enough which worked very well to kind of combine what Michael and I had as challenges. So I would say one of the best pieces of advice I would give to anyone that I ever got was get coaching and get it before there's problems. 
And then the other thing I would say in terms of how Michael and I work together or kind of what makes it work or what doesn't work. And this was a learning out of the COVID phase, even though we're a fully remote business, we're actually lucky that Michael and I are actually located in the same location, uh, at least in the same city. And we had to make a very concerted effort to spend time together physically. That time together to brainstorm, to talk things through, which went away via COVID. I mean, we would meet like this via video, but it's different than, you know, sitting together for two or three hours in the office, going afterwards to grab lunch or dinner or beer or whatever after work. And, and just having that flow that only happens when you're together. So even if I were fully remote with Michael, I'd probably be on a plane to sit with him for a day or two a month. Yeah. To have that time to, to think things through and also to look each other eye to eye and also just kind of reconnect. And yeah. it, I mean, again, I don't want to make it sound like a marriage, but it's not yeah. always, always talking about the company. It is a marriage. And you have to make sure that you're also talking about the things that aren't just the business because everyone's an individual. Everyone has their own personalities. Everyone has their quirks. There's things that drive me absolute nuts about Michael and vice versa, but you have to learn how to deal with it. And again, we've been going this path for close to, I think it's about like 13 years now that we've been working directly or indirectly together and we've known each other for longer. Yeah. You got to do it with some kind of structure and not just hope for the best, just like yeah. in a marriage. Yeah, no, fair enough. And you brought up a point, which actually I know that we were talking about before we started recording, which is around remote work. And it's funny, I'll spare you having to rehash what you said on Twitter, but basically it's interesting. Like it's an observation. I get as many data sets as you have. And it is interesting to see you cannot replicate face-to-face -face time. Now, how you can try to mitigate for that and what tools you use for that, it matters. It's something I think where everyone's discovering and you're seeing large corporations sort of reinstate office time. And I think that there's a happy medium with these things, right? The Economist had a piece that said that the average demand now, especially for younger generations, is three days in the office, no more. The employers would like to have four days. There's some tension there. But, you know, it's interesting to see how this is evolving. And uh, how big is your company now? So we're at a little bit over 50 people. So it's still fairly manageable. And in a remote environment, I think you also hit a point where it becomes quite difficult. I mean, there are success stories, right? There are businesses that have thousands of employees fully remote. Automatic is always one that comes up in the U.S. that mm -hmm. basically started remote and always was remote. I have a couple of caveats to it. So we've been... One of our lessons learned over the last four and a half years of remote is that you can't have people that you hire as juniors who are fresh into roles to learn in the remote environment. They need to be around people. So my one piece of advice to startup founders or to startups in general is you cannot hire people who have no experience whatsoever in a remote first position. They need to go and get experience in that office setup. So even if I were to look at myself or if I were giving my kid advice, I would say no matter what, do not at the beginning of your career work for a remote first company as your first job out of college or whatever, because you need to have that time interacting with people. You need to pick up on even just the body language that you oftentimes don't see when you're on video. And we've also learned a lot. And I don't think we've done everything right because we started out in one office, right? We were in Hamburg. We had the first, I think, 15 people or so we were in an office and then COVID hit. And we had actually, before COVID hit, made the decision to go remote because we saw the ability to hire better people being fully remote. Then we were forced into it by COVID and we stayed fully remote after COVID because our team is in 20 plus countries. So we're making it work, but we do get everyone together, not as a company though. So we also don't get the whole company together. We get groups of people together because again, that's, I think those days of having, you know, two, 300 people fully remote and then doing two offsites in Mallorca or you know Puerto Rico or wherever the company's based, just those costs almost negate any of the benefit of, so to speak, not having rent and whatnot. Yeah. It's a tough one. And I debate this quite often with people. I think there's certain things that like, again, what you and I were talking about, if you're going to be remote, make sure people have good quality hardware, make sure the connection is good so that you're not even struggling to hear what they're saying or to see them. Those are the simple things, but also remember that people are people Everyone has their quirks. People want to be together. It's a necessity. You need people to, you know, go out, have dinners, lunches, whatever, some kind of activities that are not work related so that they know who they're dealing with. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could yeah. say that this is to the pieces of advice that you gave earlier. It's like, this is what generates that luck sometimes. Well, again, you know, this just as well as I do that if you're not out and about those opportunities or those, let's say luck situations. They don't cross your path and you want to put yourself out in front of as many chances that are out there to take advantage of those few and far between luck situations. Yeah. Uh, so 
So maybe to wrap things up, there's people who probably heard the part where we're talking about the value you bring companies in collection and in integrating. Maybe we can just wrap up with a small pitch for what kind of company would actually be best suited to start talking to you. Like when should a company start talking to you to think about when to engage with receive? So there's two types of businesses that probably right now will be in a situation where it's absolutely essential that they talk to us. It's kind of like that, let's call them tier two lenders, banks, public utilities, retailers, where they don't yet have this hyper extensive digitalization process behind them. And even when I say like banks, like for example, for us to go into a Deutsche Bank right now or an HSBC or whatever, these are huge entities, multi-country extremely difficult backends, very large enterprise installations where that's not what we're addressing with our solution. We're going after these, let's call it country banks as an example of lenders or subprime lenders. Those are kind of like the perfect type of a customer. We basically said that have lending relationships. And again, even as a public utility, someone is paying you on invoice, you have a lending relationship. We have a customer now that we announced recently, MPAL, which is basically renting solar panels on the roof to their customers. They pay monthly and they have a collection situation if someone doesn't pay, but there's still a solar panel on the roof of their customer. These are kind of the perfect types of customers for us. And also um, NPAL is kind of both. So they have that lending relationship with their customers, but they're also fast growing businesses that haven't yet put in something. So either you're like a lender or kind of a tier two player in a bigger lending industry or lending like industry. Or you're a high growth, you know, let's call it series B, C startup that hasn't yet put in collections, hasn't necessarily prioritized putting in collections. We are getting a lot of those calls right now. So I highly recommend that people, if they're not thinking about it and are seeing that they might have collections issues coming up, that they give us a ring because that's exactly where, especially in the current market situation where you need to shore up your cash and you might need to buy, you might need to buy time. Um, you can't be affording pushing a hundred million in debt in front of you, which is funnily enough, some of these customers that we talk to have a couple hundred million outstanding, which is cash that they would need to run their day-to-day businesses. Yeah. And so those are kind of the two, I would say, you know, the BNPLs and whatnot. Those are the types of players that need to have something in place if they're going to grow. One of our customers in Mexico, Aplazo, was exactly in that situation. It's a fast growth BNPL. But they were early, so they might have even bought us too early, but they're prepared. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of the impetus. Sounds good. All right, guys. Well, now, you know, it's something you need to keep track of and hopefully you'll have chats with Paul sooner rather than later. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us, Paul. And if people want to get in touch with you, you're obviously on Twitter. What's your handle? So it's just P Joseph. Uh, so my first name, initial and last name. I'm Paul at receive.com. Feel free Excellent. to reach out. Thanks All right, so much. guys. Until next time. Bye.